We'd like to give you an opportunity to worship God this morning with your finances by giving back a portion of what God has entrusted to you. Tithing is an act of worship, and as followers of Jesus, tithing is an act of worship that we are called to do. Tithes allow us, as a church, to reach out and connect people to Jesus. So to give this morning, you can go and visit thegatheringottawa.com giving. Thank you for giving. Hey everyone! Today's Good Friday message was interspread throughout various worship songs throughout the service. Our apologies for any edits that may seem abrupt. Enjoy the service. Well, I don't know if you've ever been at the bedside of someone in their final moments or in their final days, but if you have, you know just how special their last words and last phrases before passing away can be, don't you? Even if they weren't able to say all that much in their final moments as they grasped for breath, as they struggled in their last minutes, the people who were able to hear what they had to say, um, those, are, those are words that you just don't forget. You remember those words. Those words matter. They're special and they are precious. People's last words are precious aren't they? And they often, I think, reveal to us what really mattered to them, what was really most important. And this is certainly true in Jesus' case, I think, and in the seven phrases that we see him saying on the cross before he died, as he hung on the cross for six hours on that first Good Friday. These things, we want to spend some time reflecting on them here today as we consider what it is that he accomplished for us on the cross, and as we prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table together to take communion and to partake, participate with Jesus in his sufferings on the cross. So we're going to work through these seven phrases here this morning, interspersed throughout our time to, of worship, with the first phrase being from Luke 23, verses, uh, verse 34, where right after being nailed to the cross and hung to die between two criminals, we see Jesus saying this. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Think about that. For they don't know what they're doing. It's amazing to me that these would be among the first words Jesus would speak after being nailed to the cross. Not, you got the wrong guy. Not, you know, hey, just give me three days and I'll show you. I'll come back and you'll see. But Father, forgive them. They don't get it. They don't understand. They don't actually know what they're doing. That they're nailing God in the flesh to an instrument of torture and death. But that's how he reacted to what was happening to him. To this grave Injustice, the only one in the history of the world who lived a perfect, sinless, innocent life, being crucified for the sins of the world. He prays for forgiveness for those who are killing him. And think uh, for a moment about who it was that Jesus was specifically praying for here in this moment, right? He's praying for Judas. He's asking God to forgive Judas, his betrayer. The one who handed him over for a measly 30 pieces of silver. And he's praying for the Jewish religious leaders who had plotted his own execution. And he's praying for Herod and for Pilate. Those who had given in to the pressure of these religious leaders. And he's praying as well for the Roman guards and centurions who had flogged him and mocked him and beat him. And put that crown of thorns onto his head nailing him to the cross, gambling over his clothes right in front of him as he hung on the cross. And he's praying as he looks out and sees his friends and family and mockers and passerbys. He's praying for every man, woman, and child in that crowd. Those who shouted out with excitement and glee, crucify him, crucify him. After just seven days or five days, I suppose, earlier, saying, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. And finally, of course, he was praying for us, wasn't he? For you and for me. Because 
It was not just Darrison, those who were present in that moment, who nailed Jesus to the cross, that nailed him to the cross, but it was our sin too. And in our sin, we held the nails just like the rest of them did. We were just as complicit, are just as complicit in Jesus' death. And even though we weren't there, in a sense, we too have shouted out by the way that we live, um, crucify him. Crucify him as it was, it was our sin, as much as it was theirs that put him on that cross. And so Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing, because forgiveness really was the reason why Jesus went to the cross in the first place, wasn't it? It's the whole point of the cross. And so, for you this morning, as we gather here to reflect on what Jesus has done for us, if you're in a place where you're struggling with the weight of your guilt and your shame and your sin, your addiction, your failures in life, I want you to hear this. There is forgiveness for you. Forgiveness is possible because of the cross of Christ, because of Jesus. And if he could forgive those who literally put him on that cross in that moment, he can surely forgive you as well. And for that matter, if you can be forgiven, then surely you could forgive others too, can't you? So that's the first thing we see from Jesus on the cross. His first saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. The second phrase we see Jesus say is found just a few verses later. In Luke 23, verse 43, where Jesus says this to one of the thieves on the cross who was there beside him, the thief who had just repented and asked Jesus to remember him when he entered into his kingdom. Jesus, in response to that, said to him, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Or in other words, today you'll join me in heaven. Here's what this statement shows us. It shows us that that Jesus' saving grace is for everybody. No matter who they are, what they've done, it's for everybody. And it's never too late either, is it? The thief, he's on the cross. He's hours away from his own death. And yet he repented and essentially asked Jesus for mercy, for forgiveness, knowing that he was about to meet his end. And Jesus responds by saying, I'm saving you a seat in heaven today right next to me. You are welcome in eternity with me. It wasn't too late for this thief, and it's not too late for us either. Jesus' saving grace is for everybody. If, like the thief on the cross, we would just humbly and repentantly look to him as our Savior, we don't have it all figured out. This thief surely didn't. But just knowing that there's something about this Jesus that's different, that he's our Savior, we look to him, he promises us eternity with him in heaven. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise, Jesus says. Amazing. That's saying number two. The next saying of Jesus on the cross is found in John 19, verse 26, where Jesus says this to his mother. He says, woman, dear woman, behold your son. And then in verse 27, he says this to one of his disciples, to John. He says, behold your mother. Woman, behold your son. John, behold your mother. Essentially commanding John, who was not Mary's son, to take care of her after Jesus was gone. Since Jesus was the firstborn and in this patriarchal culture, was legally responsible to care for her. It's amazing, right? As Jesus hung on the cross, he's literally making arrangements for his mom. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about his family, his mom. But there's a deeper truth here worth noticing as well. That truth being this. It's that in Christ's death on the cross, a new family is formed. That family being the family of God. Where in this case, even though they weren't blood, Mary, in a sense, becomes John's mother, and John, Mary's son, and for that matter, Jesus' brother, and so on 
and so forth. All pointing here to this deeper truth that because of the blood of Christ, we who are now in Christ are family in Him. That when we place our trust and faith in Christ as our Savior, we get a new family, which is the church, the family of God. Christian brothers and sisters who are to care for one another, to love one another, and to commit to following Jesus together. Again, all because of what Christ did on the cross. He formed a new family. He formed the church. That's what we see in those words in this third statement from Christ on the cross. Fourth thing Jesus says is found in a couple spots, including Matthew 27, verse 26, where Jesus quotes a psalm, Psalm 22, a psalm of David, where in English he says this, he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Where did you go? This statement, it speaks to the spiritual anguish that Jesus was experiencing on the cross. You know, oftentimes as we talk about the cross and think about what Jesus did for us on Good Friday, we we think about the physical anguish that he endured. You know, the, the flogging and the beatings and the nails and the cross, the blood and the pain, and it's true. Obviously, Jesus... He endured incredible, intense, physical suffering on the cross. It's hard, actually, to wrap your head around the intensity of the pain that he would have experienced, as it was one of the most gruesome and inhumane deaths a person could experience. But really, his physical suffering, it pales in comparison to the spiritual suffering that he endured on the cross on our behalf. Whereas Jesus hung on that cross, He took upon himself in his own body all of our sin and all of our shame and all the death and evil and injustice that the world has ever known. All the things that separate us or disconnect us from God and from one another and all the things that destroy our lives, our relationships, our families, and our world. He took all of those things. Imagine the intensity of the suffering, spiritual anguish he would have experienced as he hung upon the cross, taking upon himself all of the world's sin. He took our place on that cross. And so, as he hung on that cross, physical suffering, spiritual anguish, he cries out the weight of the world literally on his shoulders, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he did that so that we wouldn't have to. So that we wouldn't have to cry in that way. So that we wouldn't have to cry out, where are you? Where have you gone? He did it so we don't have to. So that we could be reconciled to God. It's hard for us as finite human beings, I think, to wrap our heads around the spiritual anguish that Jesus endured on the cross. There's lots of questions that We can ask about how exactly all that works and all of that. But at the end of the day, here's what we need to know. Here's what you need to know. He endured that. He did that for you. And he did that for me. He experienced what it was like to feel abandoned by God so that we would never have to be, so that we could know him and his love and his healing and his life instead. Incredible. That's the fourth thing we see Jesus saying on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fifth saying of Jesus on the cross is found in John 19, verse 28, where he simply says, I'm thirsty. I am thirsty. Which the Gospel of John says that he said in order to fulfill Scripture so that we could know and so that he could know that his mission was complete. But it also, I think, points to the reality of Jesus' humanity as well, doesn't it? We're just like a palliative care nurse, a hospice nurse would bring a cup of ice chips to a patient who's nearing the end of their life and place a couple on their tongue to quench their thirst. So Jesus, in his humanity, experienced thirst as he was dying. 
And there's some symbolism here as well, I think, in the bitter vinegar wine that was given to him when he cried out, saying, I'm thirsty. The bitterness of that wine, representing the agony and the, and the darkness of what he was experiencing on that cross on our behalf as he paid the penalty for our sin and was separated from the Father. But it's also interesting to me, as we think of the symbolism of this, that the one who previously had referred to himself in John 4 as the living water would now thirst. The one who came to satisfy our deepest spiritual longings and, and thirst, that he would thirst on the cross. Do you know what this means? It means that he thirsted physically so that we wouldn't have to spiritually. Where in his humanity, as he hung on the cross, the living water thirsted so that we could have our soul's longings and thirsts satisfied in him. Amazing, isn't it? What he did on the cross for us. Jesus said, I am thirsty. Fifth saying of Christ on the cross. Well, the sixth saying comes from John 19, verse 30, just before Jesus breathed his last breath, where he said, It is finished. It is finished. Now, what Jesus sang here is he sang that I'm done. Is he just announcing his death on the cross? Or is there more to it than that? Well, it's interesting in the, in the Greek, it is finished. It's not three words, but one word, actually. It's the word tadalaste, which in the New Testament, uh, in those times, was a word that was written on business documents and receipts to show that a bill had been paid in full. Like that red stamp says it's paid in full. It's done. And so Jesus here, as he's hanging on the cross, about to breathe his last He's not simply saying, I'm ready to die now, but is essentially, triumphantly saying, the sin bin, sin bill, <laughs> we're not talking about hockey, <laughs> the sin bin, the sin bill has been paid in full, and every sin, every evil, every injustice has been paid for. We're talking about the sin of lust, pride, greed, murder, addiction, hatred, idolatry, oppression, and injustice, violence. The bill that we could have never paid has been paid in full. Jesus paid our tab with God. And we can now be forgiven and set free from the power of sin in our lives because sin is finished. It is finished. That's what Jesus did on the cross. It was the day death died. It was the day sin died. It was the day that Jesus conquered evil in his death on the cross. That's the sixth statement in Christ on the cross. The seventh and final statement Jesus made on the cross immediately before he died is found in Luke 23, verse 46, where he says this. He says, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And trust my spirit into your hands. Showing us that he was actually in control all along, wasn't he? That his life wasn't actually taken from him, but he gave it away. Instead, freely, he chose to give up his life for us. And why did he choose to give it up? Well, he did it for us, didn't he? He did it so that we could know that it is finished. And that our sin bill has been paid in full. And he did it so that our souls could know what it's like to never be thirsty again. And he did it so that we could know that God in Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. That he has not abandoned us, but has actually come near to us in Christ. And he did it so that we could know what it's like to be part of the family of God. And to know God is our Father who loves us. And he did it so that one day, like the repentant thief, we too could experience paradise with Jesus after we die and after eventually Jesus returns, the resurrection of the dead, and he makes all things right. And ultimately, 
He did it so that we could know and experience the grace and mercy and forgiveness of Jesus in our lives for ourselves. Knowing that because of the cross, God in Christ is no longer counting our sins against us. That's why he did it. He did it for you and he did it for me. He did it for love. Romans 5, verse 8, which we read earlier as part of our call to worship, it tells us just this, doesn't it? Look at what it says. It says that, but God showed, what? His great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners, while we were still his enemies, while we were far from him, while we were still cursing him and living our own way. He came after us in love for us. That's, that's why he did it. That's why he suffered and died on the cross. He did it for love. He did it for love. He did it because he loves you. He loves me. For God so loved the world. And he sent Jesus. Do you, do you know just how loved you are by the God of the universe? That as God looked at you and he looked at me, as he looked at us, that he was like, I'd rather die than be separated from my kids. For all eternity. You're so loved. By the God of the universe. That's what we see when we look at the cross. We see love. Well, we're going to come to the Lord's table in just a moment. But before we do, I want us to take just a few minutes to prepare our hearts in prayer. And to reflect on the Father's love for us by looking at this list of Jesus' sayings on the cross, as we've been reflecting on here this morning. And as you look at this list, as you go through it in your mind, in your heart, I want to ask you to ask God to reveal to you his great love for you. To look at that list and say, Jesus, help me to see what it is that you did for me on the cross. Help me to understand in just a... Just a small glimpse, small snippet, because we can never fully comprehend what it is that he did for us. Show me what you did for me on the cross. So we're just going to create some space, some quiet. The Apostle Paul, when he talks about taking communion, he says that we should take some time to prepare our hearts before coming to the table. And so we want to do that here together, just to take some quiet, to look at this list, to pray, to pay attention to what's stirring in our hearts, and to pray that before... God, let's take a few moments to prepare our hearts for communion by looking at this list together. Lord Jesus, um, as we consider your words on the cross, we're struck again by what it is that you did for us. That you did what we could not do. You died the death that we deserved. That we deserved. But you made a way for us to be made right with God as a result. We could never have done that by being really good, by following the rules, by doing all the right things. Only you could have done that. As the perfect, sinless sacrifice, God in the flesh. What great love we see on the cross. 
And so this morning, in our hearts and and minds, words fail us. We we can never really know what to say in response or what to do. But we just say thank you. Hearts full of gratitude and praise, worship, declaring that you are our Savior. You are the one that our souls, our hearts long for. We long to know you, to be obedient to you, to follow you, to live for you. Not out of a desire to earn anything or prove anything to anybody, but just in response to your grace for us. And Jesus, as we look to you this morning and consider the cross, um, remind us again of just how loved we are by the God of the universe. We forget this sometimes. I do. We go looking for love in other places, in our accomplishments our successes, in our career, making money, in relationships, whatever the case may be. But you, the living water, you are the one who satisfies our souls. Jesus longing, nothing else will do. You alone are worthy of our praise and our worship, our adoration. So we worship you just in response to what it is that you've done. We say thank you. I'm going to invite our communion servers to come forward uh, this morning. Um, In just a few moments, we're going to come to the Lord's table together. We're going to have two stations uh, for you. There's also, for those who would prefer, um, we do have those prepackaged elements as well in a bowl up here on the table. So if you're not able to or comfortable or whatever, if you serve communion, that's fine too. You can come to the table and grab your own package. But when... uh, When you're ready, in just a few moments, we'll be inviting you to come forward to one of two stations, and you can come along the outside and kind of return back to your seat this way. Um, If you're a follower of Jesus in this place, if you know, or at least are, you know, trying to live into, trying to understand what it is that Jesus did for you on the cross, you're welcome to come to the table this morning. The table is open for everybody who knows Jesus. But if you're not sure where you stand with Jesus this morning, Please don't feel any obligation to participate in this. This is for people who are followers of Jesus. I'm going to read for us um, from 1 Corinthians 11. I should also say, you can just come and take the bread and eat eat it right away. Take the juice and drink it right away as well. Um, But let me read for us from 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23 through to 25. For this reason, I pass on what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink of it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even... Well, friends, thanks so much for joining us on this Good Friday. If you're in need of prayer this morning, I uh, would love to have the chance to, to pray with you. So please come forward afterwards and speak with me. Or an elder will be up front, and uh, we'd love to pray with you and for you. If you don't know Jesus, if you're here and you're like, I, this is kind of new to me, or I'm not sure where I'm at with God, and you want to take that next step of faith, I'd also love to come and talk to you as well. So please come and see me. Let me read this as our prayer of benediction over you. I hear the bell going, so I suppose you are dismissed in just a moment. So may you go with the assurance of forgiveness that is made possible through the sacrifice of Jesus. And may you go knowing just how deep the Father's love is for you. And finally, may you go in hope and anticipation of the ultimate victory that comes 
with Easter, knowing that it's Friday, but Sunday is coming. Hope you'll join us on Easter Sunday, 10.30 a.m. We're going to be hearing some stories, life stories of victory and resurrection from people in our church through some real difficulties and, and challenges. So hope you'll be here. We're going to have some treats, Easter treats and coffee as usual. So make sure to come early. Join us on uh, Easter Sunday morning. But for now, I hope that you'll uh, rest in the Father's love for you as you consider the cross and what it is that Jesus did for you on that first Good Friday. God bless you guys, and we'll see you hopefully on Sunday.
there below see the child trembling by her father's side now I can tell you why she is why you